Good morning. Welcome once again to God's house for worship. It's good to be here with you gathered around God's word to listen to the good news of our salvation. Praise our Lord for all of his goodness to us. This morning, our guest preacher is the Pastor Schmitzer, my Pastor Schmitzer. He's been my Pastor Schmitzer for 40 years now. My dad is here today, retired Pastor Alois Schmitzer, to bring us God's word and our sermon message. We thank him for being with us this morning. We are continuing our walk through this epiphany season, following our Lord Jesus from his baptism in the river to the Mount of Transfiguration. And you see in in the headline, it's a journey that reveals who Jesus is. And today we marvel at how he reveals that he is the Son of God through teaching his powerful word, powerful word that calls us to repentance and assures us of the forgiveness of our sins. So we'll look for that theme as through our, our lessons and our hymns and our prayers also in our sermon message this morning. And uh, the school children will be singing this morning, or some of the school children, the, the younger school children. We welcome their families, especially who are here with us this morning. We're very glad you joined us for worship. And those who are watching our worship videos and watching online too, thank you for joining us for worship today. Our worship starts with our first hymn. It's hymn number 833 in the blue hymnals in front of you, I Run to Christ. May our Lord Jesus be with us today and bless our worship together. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. 
I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, keep your family continually in true faith, so that those who rely only on the hope of your heavenly grace may be protected by your mighty power. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The St. Matthew's children pre-K through 2 are invited to come forward for singing their anthem, I've Got a Robe. Thank you, students, for singing for us and for your Lord this morning. Got some beautiful voices in that choir. Our first lesson for this Sunday is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 27 through 31, printed there for you in your bulletins. Even as our Lord, through his powerful word, calls us to repentance with his law, he also promises us the sweet comfort of the gospel the healing and peace that he offers us through the forgiveness of our sins. We read these comforting words from Isaiah chapter 40. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 103. It takes the form of a hymn. We'll sing the four verses 
that are printed for you there in your bulletin. Even as we humble ourselves before the Lord in repentance, we don't have to worry about his judgment on us because he promises us his mercy and his grace. And so we have great comfort when we turn to the Lord in faith. As Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand and we'll join in singing our gospel acclamation. Our gospel lesson is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39, where Jesus revealed his power not only in doing miracles, but in preaching the powerful word of God. As he shows us in these verses, this is why he came, not to heal every disease on earth, but to teach the word of God so that souls will be saved. We read from Mark chapter 1. 
As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went out to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. We invite the children who are with us this morning, if you'd like to come forward for a special children's message, come on up and sit down here down front. Oh boy, there's a whole bunch of you here this morning. This is great. Holy cow, come on down. Hello, everybody. I brought a special treat with me today. Oh, Rowan, you really want to sit next to me, huh? All right. Oh, you saw these, huh? Who can tell me what these are? What, what's, what's in there? Who knows? What are those, Austin? You see those little guys? Oh, yeah, we got some hungry folks in here. What are they, Austin? What's this? Cupcakes, pretty close. They look like cupcakes because they're in little cupcake platters. But what are they? Brownies. They're brownies, right. How many of you have made brownies before? Okay, we're going to talk about making brownies here this morning, right? We find my first ingredient as we put brownies together. What do you like to put in brownies? What do you put in brownies? Like that. That stuff. You're right. But what stuff goes in? Who can tell me what these are? These are chocolate chips. Do you guys like chocolate chips? They are delicious, aren't they? You do. Why don't we pass those around? I'll let you each. You can grab one if you want, just one. If you want to take one, you can grab one. Chocolate chips are delicious, aren't they? Yeah, Ghirardelli puts those in their brownies. They are really, really good. We've got a few other ingredients that need to go in, in our brownies, too. Um... This is cocoa powder. Cocoa is one of the ingredients in chocolate. Do you think you like cocoa? Yeah. Yeah? You think so? You wanna, anybody want to stick your finger in there and try it? Try a little, try a little cocoa powder? Yeah? Oh, you're going to try it? Oh, okay. Good. How's that taste? Hold on just a second. How's that taste, Brooklyn? Oh, we got a sour face. All right, Bo. You want to try it? I thought you guys liked chocolate. That's cocoa powder. Yeah, it tastes, tastes really good. Some people think it tastes good. Other people don't. All right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't get too excited. I know this is very excited. I'm excited too. This is baking powder. You put baking powder in your, or baking, in, well, in your brownies, right? You guys want to try some baking powder? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, hold on. That's not, that's not the one yet. Hold on, Rowan. <laughs> We're getting a few sour faces. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't taste as good, does it? This is flour. You want to try some flour? Flour? Yeah? Tastes like flour? Does it taste like brownies? doesn't really taste like brownies, does it? Because it's just flour, right? It's just flour. All right. Oh, you guys passed the... Hey, we actually got some chocolate chips back. I'm kind of surprised. Oh, All right. Oh, no, hold on. Well, did You didn't get one, did you? There you go. And try one. And I got some raw egg here. Does anyone want to try some raw egg? Actually, this is just orange juice. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you guys, but your parents all, all groaned when I said I had raw egg up here. They wouldn't want you to eat raw egg, would they? 
But yet, how about a brownie? Does anyone want to eat a brownie? Hold on. <laughs> They're disappearing here. Does anybody want to eat a brownie? Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. You guys got to back up. Got to back up. Back up. By <laughs> no. Some people don't. You can have one. Go ahead. Here, take it back. Take it back. <laughs> that one's yours now. <laughs> this is going great, guys. All right. Yes, you can have one. Can you guys help me? Oh, I don't want to spill that one. I'll put it back here. These are brownies. So we had all of those ingredients and others. Some of them don't taste very good, do they? Go ahead, John. Go ahead. You guys can have one. All right. Okay, the rest of you I'll get after, the, after we're done talking, all right? I promise I'll give you some. But we're going to talk for just a minute so it's not too long. So all those different ingredients go into your brownies. Some of them taste good, didn't they? Chocolate chips. Who liked the chocolate chips, right? Who tried the cocoa powder and thought it tasted yuck? Yeah, the cocoa powder kind of tasted yucky, didn't it? And, and the baking powder? The baking powder? Raw egg? That is not a good taste. But when you combine them all and put them all together in a brownie, they taste really good, right? The end result is a delicious brownie. Just a second. The same is true about life. There are things that happen in life that are wonderful. What are some of the things you get really excited about in life? Um, not really cool. um, you forgot already? Well, let's give some, some good things. What happens that you're excited about? Christmas. Christmas presents, you were going to say? Yes, Christmas presents are very exciting. What else? Baby chicks being born in the spring, right? That's exciting. We went to a basketball game. Who likes to lose a basketball game? No. We like to win. When you win a basketball game, that's fun. But do you always win? Does God promise you that you're always going to win? No, no. He doesn't promise you're always going to win, does he? Some things that happen in life are very sad. They kind of taste like that baking powder or the cocoa. It's even cinnamon itself, you ever put cinnamon? Cinnamon does not taste good by itself. It smells good, you're right. And there are things that happen in, lives that make, that in our lives that make us sad. When we lose a, a game, when someone gets sick, when we get sick, how many of you have been sick recently? Oh, I'm glad we just shared a bunch of donut or a bunch of brownies then. Um, when someone gets sick, maybe when someone dies, there are sad things that happen in life. And the wonderful thing that we learn from God and his word is that he takes all of the things that happen to us in our lives and he works them together for our good. His goal for us is that we would be in heaven with him someday. And because Jesus is our savior who took all of our sins away, we know that everything that happens to us in our lives, God is working toward getting us to our home in heaven. So even when we go through sad things, sicknesses, hardships, lo losing a basketball game, we know that God is using that, along with all the good things, to bring us closer to himself and to get us closer to eternal home in heaven. So let's fold our hands and pray and give thanks to God for the good things and the bad that happen in life. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for sending your angels to guard and keep us every day. We praise that through their work in our lives and through your, your rule over us that you are working all things for our good. We ask that you would help us to trust in you even when things are difficult so that we can cast all our anxiety on you, trust in you, and rejoice and give thanks every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you all. You can take the rest of your brownies back. Did anyone not get one yet? If you didn't get one and you'd like one, you can come up and grab one. And the congregation will finish, will join by singing our hymn of the day. Okay. I hope I brought enough.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we focus our attention for our sermon on Jonah chapter 3. Uh, most know the fish part of the book of Jonah. This is uh, uh, another part where Jonah goes preaching, uh, or God wants Jonah to go preaching to the people of Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up all their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. Dear fellow saints, robed in Christ's righteousness, the mantra of a pragmatist is whatever works. That's their philosophy. Whatever works, that's the route to take. That's, that's the way to go. And uh, you, you see that in your own life too, choosing that route, whatever works. Uh, when it comes to eating chicken, some people like to eat it with their fork. For others like me, you eat chicken with your fingers. In lawn care, uh, some might attack dandelions with that weed poker. Others uh, use weed killer to spray on the weeds and take care of them. With uh, disciplining children, some parents may find that taking away dessert is what works. Or others may find uh, cutting back on TV or, or computer time is what works. When, when doing the laundry, some feel that uh, putting the clothes in the Dryer is the route to take for others. It's got to be on, on the clothesline to dry the clothes. Whatever works is uh, usually a, a, a decent philosophy in the, in the little things, especially at life. But just because something works and brings results, uh, most of the time, even quick results, doesn't necessarily make it good, does it? Shaking a baseball bat at your neighbor's head may get him to turn down his loud music even quickly and bring uh, immediate results, but it's going to cause larger problems in the long run. Or in parental discipline, it might make things a lot easier not, not to do anything at all uh, and may uh, make uh, parenting uh, a lot easier for the moment, but bring horrible results down the road. And uh, working overtimes, wor working weekends, every opportunity certainly may bring uh, larger financial results in the short run, but even health problems and uh, family problems, marital problems, spiritual problems, problems in the long run. Just doing whatever works isn't such a good philosophy. 
And Jonah found that out. Jonah found that out that by doing just whatever worked best for him was not the route to go, especially when it disagreed with God and his word. And you know what Jonah did. Uh, God gave him the direct command to go to preach in Nineveh, and Jonah went the opposite direction. He thought that's what worked best for him. And you know what happened. God sent the storm at sea. God sent the big fish to swallow Jonah, got him turned around finally in the right direction. And our sermon reading for today highlights that truth for us, too, that... uh, just doing you know, whatever works for us is, is not a, a good path to follow. But doing and following God and his word always works, is always the right way to go. And uh, Jonah found that out. God's law, we're reminded today, works sorrow for sin. God's Gospel works faith in our hearts and fruits of faith for him in our lives. The word works. We follow God and his word. That's what works. And those are, well, the law and the gospel are the two main teachings in the Bible. The law teaching of the Bible, of course, is all God's commandments, all God's do's and don'ts, and even his threats of of punishment for breaking those commandments. That's the law. And God commanded Jonah to speak a fearful message of his law to the Ninevites for their wickedness. And they they were very wicked people. The Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, the ruling empire that controlled the Middle East uh, in Jonah's day, about 800 years before Christ. And Uh, Even the prophet Nahum wrote about the wickedness of these people when he wrote, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Who has not felt your endless cruelty? So God sent Jonah to proclaim the message of God's law for their wickedness. And uh, the the message, in, in short, was this. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. And it worked. The message of God's threat of of his law worked in the hearts and lives of the people of Nineveh. It says, they declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth, even the king. Even the king. Uh, Putting on sackcloth and ashes and sitting in the dust, all of these things were signs of sorrow. They were sorry for their their sin, their wickedness against God. And uh, God's law came down on Jonah too, didn't it? When he rebelled against God, he thought that going uh, the opposite direction was what worked for him. Uh, And the the very first verse of the book of Jonah starts out saying... The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up against me. And what did Jonah do in response to God's command to go to Nineveh? It says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish, the opposite direction. He found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And the condemnation of God's law came down on Jonah. And you know what happened. God sent that terrible storm on the sea. And, and Jonah, it threatened the life of Jonah and all the, all the people on board the ship. And Jonah knew exactly why it happened. It was because of his rebellion. He told the sailors, I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Jonah saw his sin of rebelling against the Lord, and he was sorry for it. The word worked. The law of God worked on their hearts. They were sorry for their sins. And it works on our hearts, too, same way. Like Jonah and the Ninevites, we just often do whatever we think works best for us, even if it's rebelling against God and 
doing things that are, are sinful and, and wicked and the opposite of what, what he tells us in his word. And when we do what we think works best for us, even though it's not in agreement with God's law, we sin. And when we sin, when we break those commandments, we hopefully remember whom we're sinning against. It's God's holy law. It's, they're his commandments. We're sinning against the holy God, our almighty creator, God who gave us life and gives us everything that we have. And when we sin, when we break God's commandments, in a way it's almost like another hammer blow in the nails of Jesus on the cross because he, he died there not for his sin. He was bearing the brunt of the guilt and punishment for all of our sins, all the times we do what we think works best for us and forget about what God says is the best in his holy word and his holy law. And when we, we think of that, we feel sorry for our sins. And that's good. Sometimes God will let the, the, the brunt of his law be experienced by us in another way. He'll let us suffer some of the natural consequences for our sin. If we lie and cheat and, and steal and gossip, uh, people might not trust us so much. That's God's law coming down, bearing down upon us. If we uh, do and say things that hurt other people, they might not like us so much. They might pull back from uh, a relationship with us. That hurts. That's God's law at work again. And that's what God wants, his word to work, his law to work, that sorrow for sin in our hearts. And secular psychologists will often say, <clears throat> that's not good. All this talk about sin and uh, guilt is depressing and counterproductive. Uh, but it, it works. It's the truth. We are sinners. We are deserving of God's wrath and punishment. And that word of God's law works. It works sorrow for sin in our hearts and lives, and that's good. It's good because that sorrow for sin moves us to hunger for the gospel, the good news of God's grace and forgiveness, which is uh, that other, the main teaching in the Bible. And uh, we see that's, that's how the, the Ninevites reacted. They were hungry. When they felt their sin, they were hungry for the good news of the gospel. The book of Jonah records that when Jonah proclaimed the threat of God's law, it says the Ninevites believed God. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, let everyone urgently call on God. And when it says the, Israel, or the Ninevites believed in God and his message, that word believed in the original language is where we get our word amen from. The Ninevites said amen to God's word, God's message to them. They not only believed the threat of God's law and punishment for their sin, but they also believed the gospel. They believed God to be gracious and forgiving. And he was. It says, when God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So also with Jonah. When Jonah felt sorry for his sin of spitting in God's face and uh, thumbing his nose at God, going the opposite direction of what God told him to, to do and to go, he felt sorry for his sin and he found the Lord God to be gracious and forgiving for his sin too. When he sailed for Tarshish instead of Nineveh, God sent the storm on the sea, and the sailors threw Jonah overboard. When, they, when he, Jonah admitted he was the reason, it says they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. 
And then God sent that huge fish to swallow Jonah, not to kill him, not to destroy him, not to punish him, but to save him, to rescue him. He spent three days and three nights in the belly of that fish, it says. And then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And Jonah, in his prayer of thanksgiving, saw it. He rejoiced. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me, you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Salvation comes from the Lord. That good news of God's grace and salvation, his love and forgiveness and his rescue of rebellious Jonah brought joy to his heart, strengthened his faith and trust in that forgiving God all the more. The word worked. And the word works with us too. Like Jonah and the Ninevites, our, our lives have uh, wickedness and rebellion and disobedience. We do what we think works best for us instead of listening to what God says is the route to go in, in our lives. And his law works sorrow in our hearts when we remember we're sinning against our, our gracious God. But then we hear the sweet message of the gospel too. He's gracious. He's forgiving to sinners like me and sinners like you and Jonah and, and the Ninevites. And like Jonah and the Ninevites, when we hear that wonderful message of God's gospel, his promise of forgiveness for our disobedience and rebellion, it, it strengthens our, our faith in him. We, we believe all the more. What a, what a gracious, forgiving loving God we have. And we're reminded that uh, he, he rescued us, not just from the pits, from the bottom of the ocean, but he rescued us from hell. And he did it, of course, not by sending a, a whale to swallow us and spit us up on dry land, but by sending his son to rescue us by, by sacrificing his innocent life as the the, the holy son of God on the cross for, for rebels like you and me and Jonah and the Ninevites. And over and over again, we hear that gospel message in God's word uh, that we hear proclaimed at God's house here in the school classrooms and Christian homes as we read our, our Bibles and the word works. God tells us again and again, he forgives us, he loves us. Even stinkers like, like you and me, who do what we think is best, instead of listening to what God says. And how wonderful that is, the word works, when that wonderful gospel keeps reminding us of his love and forgiveness. It works on our hearts too, strengthens our faith and trust in him. Imagine how, how Jonah felt when God had the, the fish spit him up on the shores on dry land. We have all the more reason to, to rejoice and, and feel wonderful because God's rescue of us lands us on the shores of heaven. The word works. God is working through his word to cause sorrow for sin in our hearts and faith in God's grace and forgiveness uh, in our hearts and lives. And not only did the uh, word of God's law work sorrow in, in the hearts of these people, and his gospel worked faith to, to trust in God all the more in their hearts, God's gospel also worked fruits, good works in their hearts and lives. It says, the king of Nineveh decreed, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And it says, God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. The gospel worked fruit of faith in their lives. 
and the gospel worked fruits of faith in, in Jonah's heart and life too. Our reading begins, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city, city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And what, did it, what happened this time, the second time? It says Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Things were different this time. And it says Nineveh was a city of lots and lots of people. Uh, there were, were people there who needed to hear the message of God's word, the law, to point out their, their sin and their wickedness, and the gospel to point out the, the grace and forgiveness of, of the true God. And the word worked. And who knows how many hundreds or thousands of Ninevites we will see in heaven someday because of the fruit that God worked through his gospel in the hearts, yeah, in and through the hearts and lives uh, of Jonah and the Ninevite people. And the word works in our hearts and lives the, the same way today too. Uh, do you remember Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed uh, told in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? It's one parable that uh, Jesus really spelled out uh, exactly what he was teaching and meaning uh, in the pictures of the sower and the seed. It, it's about the same thing, the growth and the fruit that comes from the word of God. The same lessons we see here in, in this account of Jonah and the Ninevites. We look at them, their faith was weak or non-existent, Fruits of faith were lacking at best in their lives. They uh, did what they thought worked best for them, and the word of God came and, and changed everything. Changed, changed them, their, their hearts and lives in a total different direction. Instead of uh, their own way, they were following God's direction. Instead of living life in the pits uh, of sin and headed for hell, they were now living in the joy of God's grace and forgiveness uh, and headed for heaven. They knew that they were rescued too, not just from drowning, but from the punishment of hell that they and we all deserve for our sins. Rescued by God's gracious sending of his, his own dear son for their sins, for yours and mine. And the story of Jonah and the Ninevites is, is your story too. It's my story also. We learn from God's law that we are sinners deserving of God's wrath and punishment. But God's gracious gospel message tells us there is for full forgiveness for all of us because of the gift of God's Son. God works through his word. He works faith in our hearts and fruits of faith in our lives. And that's important to remember. The, the word works. It's still work, it, working right now it, in our hearts and lives too because uh, do you ever wish you had a stronger faith? Do you ever uh, wish you uh, were a little stronger in fighting that nagging temptation? Do you ever wish that you had a little more patience or, or love or forgiveness in your heart for that irritating neighbor or a co-worker or classmate or fellow church member? The word works. God works through his word, his message uh, of law and gospel to turn us around from doing what we think, whatever works in our hearts and lives, to living for him and with him. And may that message of God's law always work sorrow for sin in our hearts and a hunger for the gospel. And may that precious gospel message always work to strengthen our hearts and bring forth fruits of faith for him who lands us on the shores of heaven. Amen. Please rise.
We confess our faith in the one true God with the words of the Apostles' Creed, page 12 in the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Please stand and join with me in the responsive prayer of the church printed in your bulletins. We give thanks to you, dear Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh to preach the gospel and cast out the works of Satan and the corruption of sin, which we could not overcome. By your word, rescue us from every evil of body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the Church, give joy to your servants whom you have given the responsibility to preach and teach the gospel. We pray that through your work many souls would be saved from every nation and that together we may share in the blessings of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, give to all Christian homes the endurance and self-control that come from your Holy Spirit. Give to husbands and wives, parents and children that faithfulness to be disciplined in their duties run their course in this life in accordance with your word, and continue to the end in the holy Christian faith. Finally, graciously bestow to them the imperishable wreath of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Almighty God, creator of the world and its foundations, your authority stands over the powers of nature and the rulers of the earth. Graciously preserve our land with its farming and industry. Watch over our leaders as well as our people. Do not disregard us for our sins, but renew us, that our lives may be peaceful and our country governed according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, your Son is the great physician of body and soul, at whose hand demons, diseases, and every ill must turn away. We bring our loved ones before you who are in need of your gracious care, especially Paulette Ross, Lucille Klan, Larry Socek, and Lyle Helke. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn, number 867, Afflicted Saint to Christ Draw Near. Now this is a new hymn for our congregation. We're introducing it today, but I think the melody is simple, and you'll pick it up after a couple of times through. So please listen carefully as our pianist introduces it please note according to the instructions that are there in the bulletin or excuse me in the hymnal we do not sing the refrain after the first verse but we will sing it after each of the other verses
Please stand for our closing prayer and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn number 607, 10,000 Reasons. Good morning again. Thank you all for being here today. Welcome our guests. We're very glad to worship with you this morning as well, and we hope you'll, we'll see you again in worship very soon. Uh, we're about to step into the Lenten season coming up. Epif Epiphany is very quickly drawing to a close, so please note on your calendars, Lent starts Ash Wednesday is Valentine's Day this year, so February 14th we'll begin our Lenten walk with the Lord to his cross uh, with those Wednesday Lenten services at, at 1.30 and 7. So keep an eye out for those. I want to say also this morning thank you to Pastor Schmitzer for bringing us God's word and reminding us how the word works. May God's word go with all of you and work in your hearts continuously. Uh, I have a few announcements, but I'll hand the mic over to Mr. Sontag. He has a couple of school announcements for us today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. 
Um, so I just want to come up to point out two things and then maybe a third thing. Uh, in your bulletin, you saw that I received a call two weeks ago to teach 7 and 8 in Janesville, Wisconsin, be principal. Um, I ask that you continue to keep our family in your prayers as we deliberate where best to serve God with the gifts he's given my family and myself. Um, also, I want to announce uh, that our preschool teacher, Miss Beckendorf over there, has accepted her call to serve now full-time. Um, quickly, a little history. She went through synod certification, so that means basically every year it's a one-year call until you're done with that. Now we've extended and she's accepted that call, meaning now we have her guaranteed for, I think it's three or four years. So let's give her a round of applause. So exciting news as God continues work through our preschool. Um, as a reminder, just keep encouraging families that you know and see who need uh, Christian education in their lives to come and talk to us. Um, Right now we're looking at next year being about the same size we are this year. We did uh, meet some new faces at preschool that we had no idea we were even thinking about coming, so that's exciting. Um, the other thing I just want to bring up too is uh, pizza sales went very well. I don't know exactly when pizza's coming in or anything like that, but I will keep you updated with that. But I appreciate your prayers, your support for our school financially. Like I said, your prayers, your time, your energy, uh, and God's blessings. Thank you. So I also wanted to mention to keep on your calendars a special voters meeting we have here at St. Matthew's coming up on February 11th. There's an announcement about that in your bulletin. Please pay attention there. And also here at the end of January, all of our members should have received their giving statements, their summary of giving over for the year 2023. Uh, they were emailed out. And also if we didn't have your email, it's in your mailbox here at church. Um, if you didn't receive it, or there's a mistake on it that does happen, believe it or not, we're not perfect here at St. Matthews. Um, so if there's a mistake on it, something that needs addressed, or uh, you didn't receive it in the format that you wanted for doing your, your taxes, those are, of course, um, tax-deductible gifts uh, to St. Matthews. Please let us know. Talk to me or talk to one of the members of our finance committee, Terlene's here today. Cheryl Davis is also on our finance committee uh, and Hope Diorio is on our finance committee too. So talk to one of them and we'll make sure and get it correct and, and, and get it to you um, as soon as we can. Those are all the announcements I have for you. God's blessings. Have a wonderful week in the Lord and stick around for Sunday school and Bible study. A Bible study we're talking about Daniel. So come and join us. Very much encourage and urge all our members to, to stay for Bible study and Sunday school. Have a great week in the Lord.